Hi class, we're going to be talking about chapter 4 in Jonathan Haidt's uh, The Righteous Mind. Before we go further, I just want you to stop for a minute to think about if what we've been learning so far resonates with your experience. So here's some of the most powerful elements for me in terms of when I read Jonathan Haidt. I, I think to myself, if I'm honest, some students who come to see me, uh, who I've talked to after class, who might maybe they're philosophy majors, I know some of their story, I'll think I'm more inclined to believe them when they tell me they're sick or to give an extension more quickly, right, with a clear conscience. Students that I don't know that well, uh, students who maybe haven't come to see me before, when they say something like I'm sick or this is why I missed, I'm more suspicious. I might grant the extension to both students, but I might not. I certainly don't feel the same way about it. Uh, one, I'm open towards the other, I'm not. When my kids ask for things, if they've been cute, we've been laughing, things have been going well, I'm like, yeah, go ahead. But if they failed to get their homework done or they didn't turn in an assignment and I just found out from their teacher, I'm like, no, you're not going to get that, right? Um, my mood, my elephant, the way in which someone triggers me or not has a lot to do with how I behave. Uh, I was uh, in London uh, not too long ago. I got an Airbnb. Uh, I knew it was outside the city, like on the outskirts, didn't really know where. When I got out from under the subway, I came up and I was basically in a Muslim area. The, all the signs were in Farsi, uh, the bells chimed five times a day for prayer, the markets were all the kind of foods that, you know, a traditional Muslim family would prepare. I was like one of the only white American people around, right? So I came up and I immediately was afraid. My elephant was like, oh no, you know, like I, I need to fit in in some way. Um, I don't feel like feel comfortable uh, with my Airbnb being here. And then I had to stop for a minute, like why do I feel this? Uh, I'm sure these people are wonderful, right? Uh, the fact that most mass shooters in the U.S. are white men, many of them claiming to be Christian. That doesn't make me afraid of white Christian men, right? I don't think anything of it. But because some terrorists are Muslim, I'm suddenly afraid of all Muslims, right? They're an outgroup. They're an other. So my elephant immediately responds and, and uh, makes me lean away. And I want to find those that are like me. I think this is why most of our churches all look the same. There are Hispanic churches and black churches and white churches, poor churches and middle class churches. And most of them are really homogenous. They look alike. Because when we're given an option on Sunday mornings of where we want to worship, we want to worship with people that are like us. Our elephants feel comfortable. We watch the same TV like the same music, like the same football team, whatever it is. And that makes me feel very comfortable, part of that community. I go somewhere, the music's different, right? I don't seem to fit in. I, I, ooh, I don't really like this that much. So we, we say we want diversity, that's important, but it's uncomfortable and our elephants kind of react against it. When I think about Jonathan Haidt and my intuitions leading to my judgments and often to my behavior, he seems to be right in a lot of ways. That the person I want to be is hard because my elephant is not the way I would like it to be. And so uh, that's gonna take some work. You might disagree. When you think about your own life and how you do things, maybe you're, you don't feel the same. Um, uh, we can keep talking. So chapter four uh, starts with a scene from Plato's famous book, The Republic. Uh, it's, it's wonderful, uh, you know, 400 BC, he's writing this stuff. And essentially, Glaucon is in dialogue with Plato. The ancient Greeks wrote in dialogues, so here's Plato's words, usually it's Socrates, then here's Glaucon, then here's Socrates. But Plato was the author, putting words into Socrates' mouth, 
putting words into Glaucon's mouth to try to have a philosophical debate. Glaucon says, well, let me tell you a story, Socrates. Uh, there's a man, Gyges. He's a shepherd. He uh, is tending the sheep. There's an earthquake. The ground opens up. He looks down inside and he sees the dead body of a giant underneath the earth. It's been opened up because of this earthquake. He goes down and explores the body a little bit, finds there's a ring on the giant. He takes the ring off. It immediately shrinks to his size. When he puts it on, he becomes invisible. He takes it off, he becomes visible again. Gyges realizes, I have a lot of power. So he proceeds to become invisible and steal. He becomes invisible to overhear conversations, to get a leg up. Eventually, he is able to kill the king and marry the queen uh, without being caught because of the ring of invisibility. And he becomes the monarch and sons uh, become you know, the king after him for many generations. And Glaucon says, Gyges does exactly what any of us would do. If we could do bad things and no one would know, no one, God wouldn't know, no people would know, well, then we would do bad things. We would use our power for our own advantage. That's how human beings work. And in fact, Glaucon says, that's how we should work, right? And Socrates says, no, I don't think that's true. It's better to be just than unjust. And Glaucon says, well, let me give you the option. You can be just in a world where everyone thinks you're a scoundrel, or you can be like Gyges, and you can be unjust in a world where everyone thinks you're noble. Which world would you want to live in? Socrates says, the world where I'm just and everyone thinks I'm unjust. And Glaucon says, no, you wouldn't. No one prefers that world. We all care what people think of us. We care about our reputation. We are managing our reputations. If we could do things where no one would know and our reputation would not be hurt, then we would do that, right? So Glaucon is essentially saying Superman is a myth. It's not real. It could never happen. If someone had as much power as Superman they would use it for their own personal gain, right? They're not going to use it to be noble, right? They would only be noble to the extent that being noble benefited them, made people love or worship them or adore them or look up to them or admire them. We are good to the extent that we get something out of it. But if we could do bad things with not having our reputation tarnished, then we would do that. And that's why the invisibility was so important in this thought experiment. Socrates says, no, 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 justice is better, even if no one sees it. And then he writes a 300-page book, Plato does, to try to defend the no notion that justice for its own sake is important. For the purposes of our discussion, Jonathan Haidt says, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, if you want to know what human beings are motivated by, follow the prestige. So on the schoolyard, why is it that a group of kids enjoys spitting spitwads at the teacher, going to the principal's office, getting suspended and whatnot? Well, because their in-group of buddies thinks it's funny. They're giggling, high-fiving each other, right? So they find prestige in being bad, in being rebellious, and they've surrounded themselves where they get the right kind of attention for that. People laugh, they're considered tough or cool in some way, and so they do what gets them prestige. I was a church kid growing up. I got prestige from doing Bible quizzing. I got prestige uh, from like doing the right kinds of things. Uh, some of it was because I was two-faced. I didn't go to youth group and tell them what I was really doing on Saturday night in high school um, or with my girlfriend because I knew that that would bring judgment. So I kind of put that to the side and I put forward the things I was doing that fit in where people would look up to me, right? We often do things because we get accolades, because people will think well of us for it, right? And if we don't get any of that, we don't do it. And so um, Jonathan Haidt says, if you want to know what motivates people, follow the prestige. Now this connects to his idea of, a re of reason and emotion. 
Reason and our ability to reason is a very late evolutionary adaptation. Our frontal lobes come along late in the game. Uh, animal brains, which we have a part of that, right, uh, are much older and they've been crafted over a long time. Our ability to reason is relatively recent and it, it emerges functionally not to pursue the truth, but reason's primary function is to defend my reputation amongst the group, to be able to tell people why I did that thing, why I like this thing. I believe the Bible is true because, and then I defend it. That's reason, right? I like this kind of food because, and I give reasons. Reason justifies me to the group that I'm a part of. It maintains my reputation. In moral terms, I have an intuition, I have a reaction, my elephant reacts, I have a judgment, and then reason gives me justification for why I responded the way I did in my elephant nature. It justifies, for the most part, and defends and maintains my reputation, because that's ultimately what's motivating a lot of my choices, right? So Height's second point, his first one was chapter three, intuition comes first, reason comes second. The thesis of chapter four is reason justifies, it does not explore. Reason is here to justify what I do, what I think, my group, my tribe, my political team. I'm here to justify that, reject the out group, Reason is not here to have an open-ended exploration for the truth. Reason is very hard to be open-minded, to listen, to weigh options. Reason wants to justify, right? Reason is a press secretary. Reason is a defense attorney for my elephant. Predominantly, not entirely, remember, reason is important. Reason can play a large role if we let it, but it is secondary. It's often making mistakes and it's often biased towards our own team, right? That's Haidt's point. So then uh, Haidt gives evidence that reason is in fact biased. It's searching for confirmation and justification. Reason is not searching for the truth. So some examples are um, we give uh, participants things to read about abortion or immigration or whatever it might be, right? Controversial issues. If it's something that the reader agrees with, they read it rather quickly and they don't ask a lot of critical questions about it. But if you ask participants to read something they don't agree with, they tend to read it more uh, scrupulously, like they're really looking at it. They say, well, who wrote this? Where did they get this information from? They ask more probing critical questions because when we read something we agree with or we hear something we agree with, they're like, yeah, yeah, of course that's true, right? Yep, yeah, I pre preach, brother. When we hear something we disagree with, we're immediately like, wait a second, why should I trust you? Where did you get that information, right? So we're not equally skeptical. We're not skeptical of our own political party. We don't ask probing questions of them, only of our the opposing political party. We don't ask theological questions of those that agree with us. We don't ask critical theological questions of ourselves. We ask critical theological questions of others. We're trying to justify our own view and tear down the opposing view, right? Reason seeks to confirm our biases, right? Bias confirmation. They also show that people with higher IQs uh, could generate more reasons on the whole than people with lower IQ. So if you're smarter, uh, if you have a college degree, you can generate more reasons. But what they found is people don't generate more reasons on both sides. People with a higher IQ simply generate more reasons for their own side and less for the opposing. So it's not as though I give equal weight. I am confirming, justifying my, my biases in many respects. Uh, there's also there's also the ability to convince ourselves we haven't done anything wrong, uh, to justify uh, the things that we do uh, so that we can go to sleep at night, so that we feel okay. Dan Ariely, he's written a wonderful book called Predictably Irrational, How Humans Are Predictably Irrational. 
But in there, he talks about having a personal fudge factor. Everyone has a personal fudge factor. And if you want to know what that is, just play golf with someone. How much do they allow themselves to kick the ball out of the rough, take a mulligan, etc., before they realize this score that I'm giving is meaningless? Like, I can't realistically give myself an honest score. Some golfers have a tiny fudge factor. Some golfers have a really large fudge factor. Well, that's true in life. Uh, some people feel comfortable like, well, that was just a white lie. I was just trying to protect their feelings. That's no big deal. Uh, but, you know, this other lie, I was really trying to get away with something, and that makes me feel guilty, and I need to say something. Uh, fudge factor. Other people feel like all lies are wrong, and I, I feel bad about all of them. Smaller fudge factor. And so uh, the amount that I allow myself to get away with, right, is a way in which I'm sort of rationalizing my behavior. Like, well, yeah, the Bible says divorce is wrong, except for in cases of adultery, but... You know, there are these other situations that seem to allow for divorce as well. And so I'm going to justify those divorces. By the way, I'm okay with that. Like I, I'm okay like in situations of abuse and extreme neglect. Like I think divorce can be an okay thing. But I'm justifying. I'm saying it's okay to not read this verse this way. I'm going to go in a different direction, right? Um, the danger is, am I doing this? to try and justify something I want to do, something I want to be true? Or am I doing this for legitimate moral reasons? And that's not always easy to know. How large has my personal fudge factor become? Well, think about it. The call of Jesus is like, give your money to the poor. Live with the marginalized. Jesus was poorer for a reason. Pick up your cross. We're called to a radical life to live on the margins, to live with the most vulnerable. Most of us don't do it, and most of us don't feel bad about not doing it. And many of us are in ministry. Where, where has the high bar of Christian discipleship gone? We have this giant fudge factor, and we say, well, but compared to most others, we're doing okay, right? You know, we're working on it. And so are we even aiming at the right sort of Christian ideal anymore? Do we even have the right goal in mind? In terms of the radical call of Jesus, um, am I willing to give my life, go to China, to go to places of persecution? Am I even willing to consider being called to that? Or am I, in many respects, lowering the bar and increasing my fudge factor and using reason to justify my like comfortable, convenient, sort of lazy American lifestyle, right? And so we have to be cautious of the way in which Reason is used as a press secretary or a defense attorney to justify things we probably shouldn't be doing. He also, uh, Hyde talks about the can versus must factor. I, I loved this part. If I read something, hear something, or see something that I agree with, I'm a Democrat, I hear Barack Obama see, say something, what I ask myself is, can I believe that? Can I? I mean, is it possible this is true? And there's almost always a reason that I can believe it and that it could be true. So I'm like, ah, yes, good. But if it's if I read something or hear something or see something that I disagree with, um, that I don't like, so I'm a Democrat and Donald Trump is talking about the tax plan, the question I ask is, do I have to agree with him? Must I agree with what he's saying? And I can almost always come up with a reason why I don't have to agree, why this could be wrong, right? So I accept what my in-group says as true because my in-group said it and I trust them. Okay, yep, I can believe that. That out-group said it. Wait a second, do I have to believe that? I don't think so, right? When I hear Christian arguments for the existence of God, the truth of Scripture things, I'm like, oh, yes, this makes perfect sense right? I'm already on that side. So this all seems good and well, and I'm less critical. But if I hear a, a, a Muslim talk about the truth of the Quran and Muhammad, I'm going to be like, wait a second, do I have to believe that? Is that really a good reason for believing? They might be giving similar reasons for why I should believe the Quran as I've given them for believing scripture or the Bible. But one seems convincing to me and the other doesn't. One I'm committed to, the other I'm not. One I'm saying, can I believe it? 
The other I'm saying, do I have to believe it? The standards I give for that which I agree with and the standards I give for that which I don't agree with are different. Can versus must. And so it makes it hard for us to change our mind. It makes it hard for us to really listen. Well, I mentioned in a previous video about my, my mom and climate change. When she hears climate change, she asks herself, do I have to believe in climate change? Do I have to believe that humans are responsible for the warming of the globe? She says, I don't think I have to believe that, right? It might be a natural occurring phenomenon. I don't have to believe it, right? But when it's something she does agree with, she's not saying, do I have to believe that thing? She's saying, well, can I believe that? Oh, sure, I think I can believe that. And so it's a much lower bar. And it's a way of protecting our worldview and insulating ourselves from being really open, um, especially about our moral judgments and the moral communities with which we're a part. Um, one of the things that is really striking to me, and this is tough, I'm not sure what to do about this, but it, it shows you how we are wired to be tribal. Our brains neurologically are wired to be tribal. So this is a fascinating study. They've done this now multiple times. The first time they did this was in 2004. George Bush Jr. was going up for re-election against uh, John Kerry. So Bush was the Republican, Kerry was the Democrat. And so the country's divided, all of that, right? This is post 9-11. Um, and what the researchers did is they brought people in. Again, they had them fill out questionnaires, very liberal, somewhat liberal, very conservative, somewhat conservative, male, female, age, all that sort of stuff, right? And then what they did is they gave uh, a series of vignettes. And here's how it goes. The first is quotes from George Bush Jr. when he was the governor of Texas praising Enron. Enron was a big Texas-based company. They were making lots of money. They had a lot of prestige. And George Bush Jr. was praising Enron and said, if I ever become president, I would run uh, the country like uh, a business, like a CEO. And so uh, these quotes were before Enron was found to be a scandalous corporation. They committed economic fraud and went out of business. But before Enron fell, uh, George Bush praised them, right? If you are a self-identified conservative reading George Bush's comments about Enron after the crash, the pain centers of your brain go off. Literally, the part of your brain that is associated with pain, like, oh, right? Like you're reading it like, oh, you're kidding me. George Bush said this about Enron. They're so sleazy. They collapsed. You know, they stole people's pensions. And it's painful to read that as a self-identified conservative. But if you're a self-identified liberal and you're reading the exact same quotes from George Bush, your pleasure centers are going off in your brain. Dopamine is being released in your brain. Wow. It's the same exact information, the same quotes from George Bush, but if you're a self-identified conservative, pain centers are triggered. If you're a liberal, pleasure centers are triggered. So you are now neurologically connected, neurologically wired to your political party, right? So you're, you're not objective anymore. The same information brings one person pain and the other person pleasure immediately, automatically, your elephant responds based on your tribal commitments, your tribal loyalties. The exact opposite is true when they gave John Kerry trapped in a contradiction. So they gave uh, John Kerry quotes uh, about how he felt about a certain policy, and then they showed more recent quotes where he had flip-flopped. Right, where he's clearly contradicting himself. Self-identified liberals, pain centers going off when they read the John Kerry contradiction. Self-identified conservatives, pleasure centers going off. We are not objective. We are not neutral. We are not rational. We are predominantly emotional and tribal. This is partly why I think Christians need to disentangle themselves from political parties. I don't think Christians should be too Democratic or too Republican. We need to separate. 
We need to think of the gospel of Jesus and the kingdom of God as being our politics. That needs to inform our politics. That will make us conservative on some things, more liberal on others. But the moment I associate myself as a Democrat, then I am immediately now tied to that and my emotions, my elephant gets shaped by them. Similarly, if it's Republican, we need to disentangle ourselves. Um, so I've, I don't associate with either political party. The last election, I did not vote for either mainline party. I think we need more than two options. Uh, I'm trying hard to let the kingdom of God govern my living and my decision making and that be my politics in the world. Um, because uh, this evidence has just really shown me how irrational we become because of our political situation. For instance, as a Christian, uh, I'm pro-life. In other words, uh, I'm okay with abortion under extreme situations. The mothers and the baby are going to die unless the fetus is removed, you know. But on the whole, I think abortion is not the right choice. Adoption, some other mechanism such that we give this fetus the ability to live is the right thing to do, right? This is my own personal conviction. But being about life also means uh, I'm for gun control. I don't want to take all guns away, but I want to limit who can get guns. I want to make it hard to get guns. I want to limit the kind of guns people can get, right? Uh, because I want to save lives on the whole. And the evidence suggests countries with uh, some gun control have less gun-related deaths, right? My pro-life Christian stance makes me conservative on this issue and more liberal on this issue. Why aren't more Americans both anti-abortion and pro-gun control? Why is that an impossibility, right? because we're connected to our political parties that tell us not to think that way. We're so entrenched in our political loyalties that we've turned off the rational part of our brains that would be more consistent, right? Um, so I think it's there's nothing weird or inconsistent about being pro-creation uh, and, and environment, which I am, and pro-life. And yet very few people are both of those things. Why? Uh, why don't we have a lot more people, right, that have different views on different sides of the aisle? And so I think we need to think strongly about the way in which reason, which some of you are doing right now, some of you, you're turning on your reason to try to justify these apparent inconsistencies, right? Um, but... Uh, and maybe you can do that, maybe that's easy, but I'm guessing that's using reason as a way to justify rather than reason as a way of pursuing consistency or the kingdom of God or truth, right? We're trying to defend our particular political moral stances, right? Um, well, I can give some other examples. Um, so after 9-11, uh, the Bush administration passed the Patriot Act, many of you know. The Patriot Act uh, allowed the government to start surveillance. Uh, it made it easier to wiretap, phone tap, look through emails uh, if you were a suspected terrorist. Of course, it was very easy for you to become a suspected terrorist, and so uh, they began to do surveillance to try and thwart future terrorist plots. Makes sense, right? You have a conflict now. People's privacy, keeping communities safe, right? And there's a clash. And conservatives said, we've got to keep ourselves safe. Uh, we can't have another terrorist attack. We have to be pro-Patriot Act. And liberals said, we have privacy. The government can't go through our information um, and tap our phone lines and look at our emails. We, we need to put a stop to this. We, we need privacy. The right to privacy versus safety clash, right? Very interesting. Barack Obama becomes president. The NSA begins looking at big data, sifting through information, trying to identify terrorists to try to thwart terrorist plots. And suddenly now that Barack Obama's president, liberals are like, this is great. Keep us, we gotta keep society safe. The NSA isn't doing anything wrong. It's just trying to weed out bad guys. Suddenly conservatives are like, the NSA, the government, it can't look through our things. We've got a right to privacy. It can't be looking through data. But which is it? Are we privacy people or are we safety people? You can't just flip-flop depending on who's in office, right? But when George Bush puts something forward, Republicans support it, Democrats reject it. Barack Obama puts basically the same thing forward and Republicans 
rejected and Democrats support it. So we're forced, if we're connected to a political party, to be really inconsistent, really contradictory at times. Um, Republicans, we want small government. Get out of our business. Don't regulate, right? Except we want you to regulate marriage. We want you to censor what's on the Internet. Uh, we want you to uh, make it strict about who can get an abortion and who can get alcohol. And So we want small government in the economy if you're a Republican, but big government in social issues and morality. If you're a Democrat, you're like, we like government getting involved in economics. We need fairness. We need to tax the rich and provide social programs for the poor. And the government should be involved in that. Oh, wait, except the government should get out of our business when about who we want to marry, if we want to smoke marijuana or not, you know, get out of our business with censorship. Which is it? Do you want the government to get involved and be large and have more power, or do you want it to be small, right? Inconsistent. Both political parties have lots of inconsistencies. And so um, the more entangled we become, the more our elephants defend one team or another, the more our reason justifies rather than pursues rationality and consistency. So uh, Haidt talks about the rationalist delusion, right? And a delusion is a false conception and persistent belief, unconquerable by reason and something that has no existence in fact. Um, the rationalist delusion is, I'm not emotional, I'm not biased, I'm not tribal, I'm reasonable. I let evidence determine my worldview. I just let good old data determine it. Most of us are not doing that. That's a really hard thing to get to. I think acknowledging it and, and being humble about it and like submitting to some of that is the way to go. Some possible solutions that Haidt gives, he mentions the scientific community as an example. If you want to overcome some of these biases, overcome some of these problems uh, with reason as, as a justifying thing, create communities of transparency where we share openly our biases, our evidence, our data, let other people sc uh, scrutinize so we have peer review, uh, know that we're going to be asked hard questions about where the evidence came from and why we think the way we do, uh, come uh, knowing that uh, while you might be biased and the other person might be biased, together reason might be an emergent property, right? So the scientific community knows every scientist is biased, so they've got to lay all of their data on the table. They have to make all of their um, procedures for gathering data known. They have to uh, like allow others to pick their data apart and their procedures apart. We have to see whether they're duplicatable and all of that. And because it's a bunch of biased individuals coming together to hold each other accountable, reason is this emergent property that comes about and that's why we trust the conclusions that science comes to. When I'm sick, I go to the doctor because I think science has done a really good job at solving problems, right? At keeping me and my family safe. Um, they've allowed this little miracle in my pocket to exist and to do all kinds of things. They've allowed us to get to the moon, um, to provide clean drinking water by, with, through fluoride. Science has solved so many problems because of this methodology of rationality. They know the individual scientists are not. So groups have to come together to hold each other accountable that it might emerge. And maybe, just maybe, our Christian communities might be able to function like that as well. So there's hope that we can structure our lives in ways that make us more rational, more moral, more fair, more kind, uh, and, um, and more, like, more like Christ, more like the kingdom of God. Uh, more to that as we continue to move along. I hope you've enjoyed the class so far.